This video summarizes the three videos posted under this chapter exploring capital budgeting techniques. Those videos were net present value, internal rate of return and modified internal rate of return, and payback and discounted payback. The focus here will be on the decision-making processes of choosing the best project or projects rather than the calculations. Those videos went into detail on how to do the calculations. We'll review the results for the projects, S and L, that we covered in those videos mentioned above. So what were projects S and L? To refresh your memory, come down here. Here they are. There's project S, and S stands for cash flows that come sooner rather than later. There you see the cash flows starting at $800 for period 1, 200, 100, and 100, so it tails down, but much of it comes in the first period. Uh, the cost is in red there, $1,000. Then project L is where the cash flows come later, and that's the 50, 100, 500, and 800 that you see there. Project L also has a $1,000 cost. Now, we have a weighted average cost of capital listed at the bottom here, WAC, at 7%. And we use the weighted average cost of capital at various times in computing net present value, for example, in computing modified internal rate of return, and when computing discounted payback. And so what was the assumption that we were employing when we did that? Well, Project S and Project L have risk equal to the average risk in the firm. So what does that exactly mean? Well, behind the scenes, there is a firm that's evaluating these projects. So this firm that's evaluating projects S and L has a set of existing projects that it's employing in its business. And if we look at the average risk of all those projects, the discount rate that's appropriate for those projects is 7%. Now, if a project was riskier than average, it would have a risk premium associated with it. Instead of using the weighted average cost of capital of 7%, we might add 2% on to use a cost of capital of 9%. Or if it was less risky, we might have a discount rate of 5%. And so the appropriate discount rate for the average project is 7%. And so it applies to SNL because SNL have average risk. Okay, with that information, let's take a look at the results for the two projects. Here are the numbers that we want to evaluate, and we want to evaluate them like we did in the videos, under the context of either mutually exclusive projects, one or the other, or independent projects, where we can accept all of them, potentially, or we can reject all of them, or we can accept some of them, depending on whether or not they beat the criteria that we've set up. So let's go through each one. First off, let's look at the net present value. And we see the net present value of S is 80, and the net present value for Project L is $152.54. What does that net present value mean? Well, it means once you've accounted for all of the costs associated with the project, including the financing costs of 7% weighted average cost of capital, Project S generates $80.27 worth of profit and L $152 in profit. Net present value, when it's positive, means that the project is beating its costs. It's profitable. And so here we have two profitable projects. And in this case, we ask ourselves, okay, there, if the two projects, S and L, are mutually exclusive, which project are we going to accept? We're going to accept Project L because it has the highest net present value. It adds the most to shareholder wealth. If we had mutually exclusive projects, we'd discard S and just accept L. Now, if we look at internal rate of return, we want to pick the project with the highest internal rate of return provided it's greater than the weighted average cost of capital. So the internal rate of return reflects all the costs, all of the expenses associated with the project, except financing costs. How do you incorporate financing costs into the analysis? You compare it against the weighted average cost of capital. And if the internal rate of return is higher, then it's a profitable project according to the internal rate of return rules. 
And when you have mutually exclusive projects, you want to pick the one with the highest internal rate of return. And that happens to be Project S. Now let's look at modified internal rate of return. And with modified internal rate of return, you want to select the project with the highest modified internal rate of return, provided it beats or is greater than the weighted average cost of capital. And here we have Project L has the highest modified internal rate of return. So if we're looking at mutually exclusive projects, it's L. So before we go any further, it begs the question, why does Project S have the greater internal rate of return while Project L has the greater modified internal rate of return? It has to do with the reinvestment assumptions that are made with modified internal rate of return. Remember, internal rate of return assumes that the cash flows generated by the project are reinvested at the internal rate of return, which could be quite high and unrealistic. Modified internal rate of return reinvests those cash flows at the weighted average cost of capital, 7%. And once you reinvest those cash flows at the 7%, it dampens the effective internal rate of return. And in this case, provides a more realistic rate of return. Now, let's look at payback. Payback and discounted payback are in years. And with payback, let's start at payback here. With payback, we want the project that pays back the quickest. We recover our costs the fastest with the lowest payback. So we're really looking for a low payback. And how low? Well, it depends on the cutoff criteria that management has. In the video that we looked at for payback and discounted payback, we said that management had a three-year cutoff. Anything less than three years was good, acceptable. Anything more than three years means it took too long for the project to pay back, pay itself back, in other words, to recover its costs. And so if we have a three-year cutoff, well, S wins because it beats that three-year cutoff and L is takes too long. It all takes uh, almost a half a year too long. Now if we apply discounted payback, we apply the same criteria to discounted payback, we see that S just beats that three-year mark. And so that's the project that's acceptable. L we would reject because it takes three quarters of a year too long. And it would be considered risky by some people or illiquid for Project L. So S is better, more liquid, according to that criteria. Now, in red, we have the winners for mutually exclusive projects. Now, what happens if the projects are independent? If the projects are independent, the cash flows from each project are unrelated to each other. Then we could accept both S and L, or any other project we're looking at, potentially. Or we could reject them, or we can accept some of them depending on the criteria. Let's go down the list. And I'll put that in green. So we'll go down the list and we'll see how to evaluate Project SNL under independent projects. So for net present value, we want to accept all profitable projects. All profitable projects are the ones that have a positive NPV. Both projects have a positive NP NPV. So we would accept both of these projects if they were independent. Both are acceptable. So I'll put the green star there. Both are acceptable. Now, for internal rate of return, we ask ourselves, well, do the, does the internal rate of return beat the 7% weighted average cost of capital for an average project? Because average risk project? Because both of these projects are average risk. They do. Both of them beat it. So both of them are acceptable. They're independent. So, you know, go back to the the example I gave in the videos earlier was, well, if you have, uh, if you're considering a Walmart in Seattle versus a Walmart in Washington, D.C., for example, you can accept both because both are profitable. Now, let's look at modified internal rate of return. Again, both modified internal rates of return beat the 7% weighted average cost of capital, so both are acceptable. With payback, we have that three-year cutoff. And it looks like only Project S wins. And so we star that. We would reject L. Just doesn't make it. It's too long to pay back. And for discounted payback, we would pick S 
and L again does not pay itself back quick enough so we would reject it. So you can see according to what we've just done the green stars all indicate that project S is acceptable if they're independent. So let's look at the, the stars now overall and what we did. Let's start off with mutually exclusive. Well if we have mutually exclusive projects these criteria are telling us different stories. L is the better project with net present value and then if we use internal rate of return S is the better project and then if we use modified then it's L and then for the paybacks it's project S. So which is the winner? It seems like almost a tie. Well that's where we fall back on the decision rule I talked about in the very first video where we cover net present value. And in that discussion we said that net present value rules the rules. So now what I want to do is explain that statement by examining what these rules include and exclude in their computations and the pros and cons of each one. So here we have the five rules and some characteristics that we would like these rules to have. So let's look at net present value first in terms of cash flows, scale, time value of money, and risk. Does net present value utilize all cash flows? And the answer is yes, it includes everything, including the cost, which is why we have the term net here, N. And does it reflect scale? Yes, it does. So how should you interpret that? Generally speaking, the project with the larger net present value is the larger project. And for sure, it adds more to shareholder wealth than a project with a smaller NPV. Does it employ time value of money? Absolutely. And does it reflect an adjustment for risk? Yep, net present value through the discount rate reflects risk. Now let's look at internal rate of return. Does it utilize all cash flows? Yes, it does. Does it reflect the project's scale? Well, when you see an interest rate, it doesn't really work in terms of reflecting the size of the project, you can't really tell. At least with net present value, you get a dollar amount, and so you can see it adding the shareholder wealth, but with internal rate of return, you just get an interest rate. If you have two projects and they have a 10% internal rate of return each, and one is a billion dollar project versus one is a dollar project, well, as you can see, the internal rate of return is not going to help you discern which is the more valuable project to the company. And it's not that helpful. So the answer is no. Does it employ time value of money? Yes. In fact, the internal rate of return is the interest rate, the discount rate that's internal to the project itself. In fact, it's the interest rate that sets the present value of the future cash flows equal to the cost of the project. And it doesn't reflect an external weighted average cost of capital or, or a discount rate imposed on it. In fact, implicit in the calculation of internal rate of return is the cash flows generated by the project are reinvested at the internal rate of return. So you can say in a way that internal rate of return does reflect the time value of money, but not necessarily in a realistic way because that reinvestment rate, the internal rate of return, is the reinvestment rate and if the internal rate of return is really high the firm will not likely be able to reinvest those cash flows at that high internal rate of return. And does internal rate of return have an adjustment for risk? No it doesn't. Now what about modified internal rate of return? Does it use all cash flows? The answer is yes. Does it reflect scale? No, just like with internal rate of return, it's a percent. It doesn't reflect scale. Does it employ time value of money? Yes. In fact, it employs it better than what internal rate of return does because modified internal rate of return is calculated assuming the cash flows are reinvested at a more realistic weighted average cost of capital. So it does employ time value of money. Does it reflect an adjustment for risk? Yeah, it does. With the reinvestment of cash flows at the weighted average cost of capital, that weighted average cost of capital will reflect risk. And what about payback and discounted payback? Well, does payback 
reflect all cash flows? And the answer is no. It, it will ignore cash flows after the payback period. You could have a huge cash flow towards the end of a project and it won't be reflected in the payback. Will payback reflect scale? No, it won't reflect scale. It's measured in years and you can't really tell. You know, you got two projects. One's like a billion dollar project that has a two year payback and one's a one dollar project with a two year payback. You can't tell the, you know, the impact on shareholders' wealth. So the answer is no, that does not reflect scale. Does it reflect time value of money? No, there's no adjustment for that. Is there an adjustment for risk? And the answer is no, there's no adjustment for risks. However, even though the calculation does not employ an adjustment for risk, some people view the payback number that results as being an estimator of risk in and of itself. So you have to, you know, footnote this to say, well, the analysis doesn't incorporate risk, but the end result does reflect risk in some sense because a project that pays back faster is more liquid and less risky, according to the financial managers that use it. Now, what about discounted payback? Does it utilize all cash flows? No. Does it reflect scale? No. Does it employ time value of money? Yes. It corrects payback's problem for not having time value of money. And does it reflect risk? Well, the discounted cash flows, the discount rate will reflect risk. And so risk is reflected in, in payback to some extent. But again, you know, it, it won't reflect the risks associated, say, with the project after the discounted payback period. So if we know that net present value rules the rules, why are we even looking at these other rules? Well, it turns out that financial managers like using them. And having multiple rules helps them to better understand the ins and outs of the projects that they're looking at. You got to remember, sometimes these projects are in the billions of dollars. They can just look at net present value, but will they really get a feel for the idiosyncrasies of the projects? There's information in those other criteria that can be helpful, provided you know their pitfalls. So now, before I wrap up this video, I want to give you a word of caution. On the internet, you often find that net present value has weaknesses. Because, for example, the discount rate is very hard to estimate. Which is true. The discount rate may be very hard to estimate, but it doesn't mean the net present value technique is flawed. It just means that one of the inputs to the process is difficult to measure. The net present value technique is still sound. The other thing that you'll come across on the internet and in textbooks is that the net present value rule doesn't consider the constraints that firms have in raising capital to finance projects in the first place. That's true, but we're assuming that management's only going to evaluate projects that they know they can afford before they start going through the entire 